Dear Professor Muteris, thank you for your very, very kind words. Indeed, good cardiac surgery needs good cardiologists, needs good anesthetists, good perfusionists, good nurses, a good team above all. I have chosen a very provocative uh, title, The Magic of Cardiac Surgery. In times of studies, randomized studies, to speak about magic in a subject like surgery is very controversial. But give me the chance to explain you why I speak about magic. You see a picture of a, of a small baby born two days ago, weighs two kilos, has a very rare congenital heart disease out of pulmonary window. The heart begins beating four weeks after con conception. That's more than three billion beats in a lifetime. With each stroke, each chamber transports about 70 milliliter of blood, less in a child, bigger in an adult. That's way more than 450 million liters in a lifetime. And every day, the heart creates enough energy to drive a truck for 20 miles. In a lifetime, that's equivalent to driving to the moon and back. Long time ago, in the fourth century before Christ, the Greek philosopher Aristotle identified the heart as the most important organ of the body, the first to form according to his observations of embryos. It was the seat of intelligence, motion and sensation, a hot and dry organ. Aristotle was a little bit wrong. He described a three-chambered organ that was the center of vitality in the body. Other organs surrounding it, like the brain and the lungs, simply existed to cool the heart. Galen from Pergamon was also an ancient Greek physician and philosopher. In his treatise on the usefulness of the parts of the body, Galen reaffirmed common ideas about the heart as the source of the body's innate heat and as the organ most closely related to the soul. He said, the heart is, as it were, the headstone and source of the innate heat but which the animal is covered. Centuries after, Leonardo did not deviate significantly from Galen's account on it. Yet he offered a, a more elaborate mechanical account of the heart. Please see also the pictures of the heart, of the valves and of the body from Leonardo. They are magnificent and very precise. Leonardo said, the heart is of such density that fire can scarcely damage it. And then we came to the 17th century. Harvey supported at that time, thousand of years after, 2,000 years after almost, the Aristotelian notion of the heart. He precisely described that the heart is situated, uh, situated at the fourth and uh, between the fourth and the fifth rib. Therefore, he uh, commented, the it is a principal part in the principal pace, uh, place, as in the center of a circle, the middle of the necessary body. He examined carefully the function of all its different parts and came to a reverse conclusion of Galen and his medieval Renaissance readers. He believed that the heart was actively at work when it was small, hard and contracted, the systole, expelling, <coughs> expelling blood, and at rest when it was large and filled with blood, the diastole. Look at this wonderful picture there, where Harvey is in front of the King of England and he is explaining his theory about the circulation. Harvey metaphorically described the heart as the king or son of the body. 
And we came at the late 19th century, dear colleagues, and two of the most important doctors of, the, of this time, Theodore Billroth, who founded the abdominal surgery, and James Paget, they both said that operating on the heart is impossible. Bildner said, a surgeon who tries to suture a heart wound deserves the loss to lose the esteem of his colleagues. And Paget said in his book, Surgery of the Chest, that surgery of the heart has probably reached the limit set by nature to all surgery. No new method, a new discovery, can overcome the natural difficulties that attend a wound of the heart. They were wrong. Some years after, Ludwig Rehn in Frankfurt, Germany, managed to suture a wound in the right ventricle of the heart with three sutures. The patient would die. He had one chance, surgery, and that was successful. So one year later, in the Congress of the German Society for Surgery in Berlin, he could say, gentlemen, the feasibility of the heart suture should no longer be in doubt from now on. So let's move to magic. What is magic? I just look in the dictionary, in the Oxford and Cambridge dictionary, and I transported some meanings of it. So magic is the use of special powers to make things happen that would usually be impossible. Or it is the skill of performing tricks to entertain people, such as making things appear and disappear, and pretending to cut someone in half. Or a special and exciting quality that makes something seem different from ordinary things. Or even the power of apparently influencing events by using mysterious or supernatural forces. Cardiovascular diseases is the leading cause of death globally. Estimated 18 million people almost died 2019 from cerebrovascular uh, uh, diseases, representing 32% of all global deaths. The same, of course, happened in Cyprus. It's the leading cause of death uh, in 2020 with 29% of deaths caused from <coughs> cardiovascular diseases. There are almost 40,000 hospitalizations in Cyprus every year due to cardiovascular diseases and 2,000 deaths each year due to heart diseases. Unfortunately, we have in Cyprus no statistics about the most common cardiac operations. So I looked at my German society and it's quite obvious that the most common cardiac operations are due to coronary artery disease, followed by vascular disease, congenital disease, aneurysms, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and heart tumors. As you see, the percentage of valvular disease becomes larger, and the percentage of coronary disease is getting less and less, but still coronary artery disease is the main cause for cardiac operations in Germany. Coronary artery disease, as I said, is the most common type of heart disease. It's a leading cause of death in the US, the UK, and of course in Cyprus, in both men and women. Coronary artery disease causes impaired blood flow in the arteries that supply blood to the heart. It affects approximately 16.5 million Americans over the age of 20. In the picture, a fine example of a severe proximal LED stenosis. It has been just over 100 years since Alexis Carell first described the concept of operating on the coronary circulation. Carell subsequently used the innominate and carotid arteries to achieve the first aortocoronary bypass grafts. 
although the description was very accurate and very good, it was very, very difficult, impossible to say, to implicate it on humans. So we had to wait decades to come to Arthur Weinberg, who used the left internal thoracic arteries in humans. Weinberg made the mistake. Instead of anastomosing the liter in the LAD, the gold standard today, he anastomosed it in the muscle. But still it worked. It's strange, but it worked. So it managed to have variable success and often uh, led to symptomatic improvement. Professor Mutiris said how important a good cardiology is to have cardiac surgery. And the two finest examples are Werner Forsman and Sohns. Forsman was the first one to implement, he found out how to make accidentally a right heart catheter. It was in his own body. And it was in a small village not far away from Berlin. Whereas Sohns in Cleveland also accidentally made the first selective coronary angiography. Those were fundamental events for the development of coronary surgery. Some years later, 1964, Kolesov in the Soviet uh, Republic performed the first successful cabbage using the searcher technique of Alexis Karel. With specially designed magnified glasses and scissors, he grafted the left internal thoracic artery to the circumflex artery in a patient who remained free of angina during the three years of follow-up. He also was the first one to implement off-pump bypass operations. René Favaloro was a sergeant from Argentine who achieved a physiologic approach to the surgical management uh, of uh, coronary artery disease patients. The, by the bypass procedure as we know it now. He used saphenous vein autograft to replace at first and then to make the typical bridge in patients with coronary artery disease. Of course, the first treatment of coronary disease is the PCI. But still, coronary artery bypass grafting has been shown to be superior to PCI and is established as the standard of care for treating patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. The results even here after treatment are excellent. And as we have learned, data from nowadays, from literature, suggest that total arterial revascularization may even improve more the survival compared to conventional coronary artery bypass grafting by 15 or 20 percent, even compared with two arterial gloves. And we are very proud to say that we started this year operating five uh, bypass patients. Four of them were operated in OPCAP technique and all became only arterial grafts. I would like to operate with you a little bit. We have two skeletonized eaters, the left and the right. Oops. I, we don't have to hear German. And we see now how we manage to do this. We make a T graft of the right and the left uh, thoracic artery. So th that's why we gain length. And with these two internal thoracic arteries, we can perfume, I, uh, uh, perform either on beating heart or in uh, uh, cardioplegic heart, the bypass grafting. This is a very standardized and uh, reproducible technique. Valvular heart disease is any cardiovascular disease process involving one or more of the four valves of the heart. 
the aortic, the mitral, the tricuspid, and the pulmonary valves. These conditions occur largely as a consequence of aging, but may also be the result of congenital abnormalities or specific disease or physiologic process including rheumatic heart disease and pregnancy. Let's see what happens if we don't treat patients with valvular disease. The most common diseases is aortic stenosis and mitral regurg. If patients with mitral stenosis have symptoms like angina, syncope, or heart failure, they will die within five years of the initiation of symptoms. Patients with mitral regurg, especially those one with severe MR, might have significant problems like pulmonary edema, pulmonary hypertension, right heart failure, leading to death within a decade. Tufier was the first to dilate an aortic valve in 1912. I still can't imagine how he did it, but it's very surprising that he tried it. While Cutler did the same with a mitral valve in 1923. Please have a look at the left side. He put a um, scapel, something very sharp, in his finger and he put his finger in the mitral valve with the intention to split it and make the opening of a stenotic valve bigger. That's insane. And those accomplishments were individual achievements. The internist, and I, I can understand why, often refused further patients because they were not convinced by the therapy concept. 20 years later, the method of digital and instrumental valve rupture prevailed with a lot of protagonists in, uh, in the US and in the UK. Look how they, what they did in order to dilate a stenotic mitral valve. They used a dilator who was put through the free wall of the left ventricle and they used the finger to identify the position of the mitral valve in order to dilate uh, it and improve the patients. Of course, the results were not optimal, but it was the beginning. John Gibbon operated only a few times on the heart, but one time was extremely important for us because it was the first use of a heart-lung machine that he concepted in 1953. He closed an ASD and the patient recovered uneventfully. Unfortunately, all other of his patients died. So he decided not to invest more time on the development of the heart-lung machine and he started performing th thoracic surgery. Another milestone in cardiac surgery is the development of cardioplegia. What is it? Cardioplegia is a pharmacological therapy administered during cardiac surgery to intentionally and temporarily arrest the heart. It's like the winter sleep of the animals. They sleep, but you can wake them up. The first solution uh, used during cardiopulmonary bypass was reported by Melrose in the early 50s, who identified that high levels of potassium citrate induce a reversible cardiac arrest. Cardioplegia is very essential for us because it allows us to operate without damaging the heart, and it also provides us a relatively bloodless, emotionless surgical field. That's why we can make complex repairs inside the heart. That was the initiation of a lot of developments. Alfred Starr was the first one to implant a caged valve in 1960s. Uh, this one, this was the Starr Edwards valve. 
whereas Edward Harken was the first one to implant an aortic valve in 1962. Further development helped us come to more modern mechanical valves, which reduce the incidence of adverse events and help us help patients with aortic valve and mitral valve disease. Why do we need cardiac surgery? We can do TAVIS nowadays. Let's have a look. Look how calcified the aortic valve is. Look the amount of calcification in the leaflets of the aortic valve. A cardiac surgeon can excise the aortic leaflets, which are highly calcified, and implant a valve with a lot of sutures in the prepared annulus of the aortic valve. You have to take anticoagulation, but you don't have to be operated again on your heart. There were also a lot of developments concerning biological valves. The problems of calcification is now not anymore such a big problem. Modern valves, like the Inspiris Resilia, a bovine pericardial tissue, has a very low percentage of complications after implantation. And we are very happy that in the environment of Cyprus Health System, we can choose and implant the best valves available in the global market. An genius operation is the Ross operation. William Ross pioneered many surgical techniques in adults and children. He performed the first cardiac transplant in the UK in 1968. And he also showed us how to replace the own aortic valve with the own pulmonary valve. The results of the Ross procedure are excellent, helping young children and young adults overcome their problems. It is, however, a very demanding cardiac operation. Aortic valve repair is now recognized as a good alternative to prosthetic valve replacement in selected patients suffering from aortic insufficiency or proximal aorta aneurysm. We see on the left side a David procedure for the salvage of an insufficient aortic valve. Several pioneering cohorts have achieved excellent long-term outcomes up to 20 years with excellent stability of the repair. We are proud because we were the first to perform the David procedure in two patients in Cyprus with excellent success rates. I jump to the mitral valve now. We know that mitral repair is very important. Why? You have less thromboembolic complications, less hemolysis, a reduced risk of endocarditis. You preserve the subvalvular structures and we increase the survival rate. Carpentier is our teacher for the mitral valve repair. A lot of the techniques used are due to his pioneering works like the use of anuloblasty rings, the resection of prolapse, the loop technique, which we use most of the times, the patchplasty, but also the edge-to-edge -edge repair from Alfieri, Ottavio Alfieri from uh, Milano, Italy. Together with mitral valve repair, there were a lot of developments of minimally invasive mitral valve surgery. Why do we need this? We needed to reduce the surgical trauma. We needed to shorten the hospitalization of the patient and to help him return quickly to his everyday life and to minimize the postoperative pain and stress. A 53-year-old 
man operated on our clinic due to mitral valve disease could return to his activities only a couple of weeks after surgery. We went back home at the fourth day after surgery. Let's see how it works. Cardiopulmonary bypass is initiated in the groin. We perform a small incision uh, lateral on the right side. The incision is measured about five to six uh, centimeters. It can be um, easily uh, done. It's very retrobusable te technique. And uh, we use the skin retractor uh, in order to see the heart. The visualization of the heart is excellent using this, uh, this method. That's the mitral valve. The patient had anterior prolapse and after implanting loops to repair the prolapse, we implanted a ring. This ring stabilizes the valve and help us um, achieve results that they are sustainable and good over the years. Here's the water probe, the ceiling probe, showing an excellent mitral valve repair. <coughs> Congenital heart defects or diseases are problems with the heart structure that are present at birth. The problem can affect the heart wall, the heart valves, and the blood vessels. On the left side, you see a patient with a saturation of 11. It's a patient born with a transposition of the great arteries and without open uh, ASD. He had to be treated at the first day of life. The most common congenital heart diseases is a ventricular septal defect and the atrial septal defect followed by the patent arterial duct, the aortic coartation, the pulmonary valve stenosis, the aortic valve stenosis, the tetralogy of Fallot, and the transposition of the great arteries. There are numerous other conditions that uh, are congenital heart diseases. A large untreated ventricular septal defect leads in death in infancy due to heart failure and pulmonary hypertension or in adult life due to pulmonary hypertension. If the patient has a lot of luck, he will develop a right, outflow, uh, right ventricular outflow tract stenosis, but it will also lead to surgery. There is also a high percentage on morbidity, especially in infancy and childhood, related to pulmonary infections and increased pulmonary blood flow with or without pulmonary hypertension. There's also a development of subacute bacterial endocarditis. And in very less patients with a small defect, there is otherwise a spontaneous closure of defect or asymptomatic um, patients. The first one to treat an ASD was Floyd John Lewis in 1952. He was the, one, the first one to operate inside the heart. What did he do? He cooled down the patients in an ice cold bath in order to slow the metabolism, which allowed him to open the heart from some minutes. It couldn't work because of air embolism. You close the ASD, but you damage the patients. So you couldn't establish this technique. That's a funny method, but it was tried for a lot of patients. Edward Gross from Boston described the atrial wall semi-open technique. What did he do? He sewed a rubber wall or a cone in the right atrium and he used the pressure of the, the low pressure of the right atrium to touch inside the heart, identify the hole and close it. 
It's insane, but it worked. 